Okay, hi everybody, welcome to Friday. We made it through this first week of bioinformatics. We continue though to Monday, so we're still gonna get network and pathway biology on Monday. Uh, but today we're talking about my favorite topic on Earth, proteomic identification and yes, quantitation as well. Now I, I started as a graduate student at the University of Washington in 1996, just when this field was coming right off the ground to become something special and new. So I've, I've seen like where all the bodies are buried along the way, and I'll try to remember that you may be encountering tandem mass spectrometry for the very first time today. Um, if you catch me bumbling off into jargon land, feel free to just haul me right back and say, now what was that again? All right, so we're going to try to uh, cover the, the basics of how we identify peptides and thus infer proteins. It's going to be really interesting. And um, so long as we've got enough time in the 90 minutes we have assigned, we will talk a, a fair bit about quantitation as well. So um, as you see, it splits into the identification side and the quantitation side. We're going to start with fundamentals of tandem mass spectrometry. This is a fairly new area for South Africa, but there are now almost 20 facilities across the country where you can perform tandem mass spectrometry experiments. So uh, this is definitely a growing area and one that's very valuable for you to know about. Um, we're going to talk about the key algorithm, the, the greatest hit of proteome informatics, which is the database search algorithm. Uh, and then we will move on to talk about how we figure out what we actually trust from these algorithms and infer proteins from those results. In quantitation, we're going to talk a little bit about a kind of low-tech method called spectral counting, uh, one of these uh, so-called label-free methods. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about chromatograms. It's a really important vocabulary term for folks. Uh, extracted ion chromatograms. And finally, a targeted kind of experiment that focuses on getting accurate quantities for just a few proteins that we really, really care about. All right, on we go. So uh, we've been talking an awful lot about sequencers, and today we are stepping away from sequencers altogether. Instead, we're talking about peptides, and in, in the case of metabolomics, non-peptides, things that we can separate by some sort of chromatography and analyze by mass spectrometry. Uh, so in the past, I've tried to teach a little bit about protein structure and a, a little bit about uh, metabolomic net, uh, 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 networks. That's really much too big a topic. So we're going to try to stay inside this circle up at the top uh, to, uh, to deal with the data coming from tandem mass spectrometry for identification over here on the left, and on the right side, how do we deal with problems in quantitation on the right? But I want, to, I want you to be aware that these things exist at the very least. So if you were trying to model how do three carbon sugars uh, interchange uh, in the process of, of metabolism or try to measure the Warburg effect or something like that, um, you would probably want to know something more about flux analysis and about how we measure metabolites, not so much the proteins themselves. Okay, so what is proteomics? This is a question that catches people a lot, and I feel like having something to say about it is better than saying nothing at all. So we're going to start with a comment on this by the Human Proteomics Organization, HUPO. Uh, HUPO is not the, necessarily the largest body uh, in, uh, in, bioinformat in proteomics research, but they are a, a very much an international one, uh, and I, I feel like their definition has a lot to say to us. So proteomics focuses on the identification, localization, and functional analysis of the protein makeup of the cell. You can think of it as the protein equivalent of the genome, right? So uh, the proteins present in a cell, together with their function, their subcellular location, and perhaps even structure, may change dramatically with the organism and the conditions faced by their host cells, including the age of the cells, the checkpoint and cell cycle, and external or internal signaling events. So once you've sequenced the genome of a creature, you basically know the catalog of what it can produce. But under different circumstances, different parts of that catalog get expressed, as you know from the, uh, ex the lectures on gene expression yesterday, and also which ones get retained in the proteome, uh, in the, the set of proteins currently available in that cell. That means that proteomics is very much a dynamic science, that the same cell line will not always present with the same kind of expression. Hit it with a drug and suddenly that'll all change. Hit it with a, an alkylating agent, that'll all change, that sort of thing. So in a lot of respects, we have changed uh, from a parallel process in genetic sequencing to a serial process. Parallel versus serial. 
By that, uh, you remember I, I, my favorite term for modern day sequencers is massively parallel sequencing because millions and millions of templates are all getting sequences inferred at the same time. That's quite different from proteomics because generally speaking in proteomics, the instrument at any given point in time is analyzing one peptide, most typically, and under shotgun workflows that are so, so very common. So naturally, the, uh, if our process can only pay attention to one species at a time, or one uh, chemical uh, at, a, at a time, we need it to do that as quickly as possible. And current tandem mass spectrometers can analyze uh, the fragments produced from a particular peptide or a particular metabolite in milliseconds. So we may analyze uh, 10 different peptides all in one second on these instruments. This means that if you've got more than 10 peptides in your sample at least, you're going to want to, uh, analyze, uh, to analyze the samples spread out over time. And that gives us the need for chromatography or separation. So uh, this process then is going to have a high throughput serial process where the instrument takes a snapshot of this and then that and then this other, kind of like an Instagram on steroids. Okay, so um, let us go ahead and move ahead. One of, the, one of the findings from this is this last claim, scan rate. Frequently, when one studies the history of mass spectrometry, you come away with the impression that, gosh, we can, we can scan much, much more rapidly today than we could in the old days. I, I just worked up a data set that was produced by a collaborator on a triple TOF 6600 plus instrument up at CSIR. They all have very impressive sounding names, trust me on that one. Uh, but we found that over the period of a 15-hour experiment on one sample, 15 hours of a half million dollar instrument just poking away at this one sample, it produced on average eight, uh, it produced tandem mass spectra at a, at a rate of eight hertz. So every second over the space of 15 hours, this instrument was cranking out eight tandem mass spectra. That's impressive. That was not something that was feasible 10 years ago. So scan rate is really driving the way that the science is moving forward. All right, so what is a mass spec? Has anyone worked with a mass spec or do you remember a lecture relating to mass spec? Oh good, good. So we didn't do a lot with mass spec, but then I didn't take analytical chemistry as an undergrad. Think how much that probably set me back as a grad student, <laughs> considering that I, I, some of my first papers were in analytical chemistry journals. So uh, I, I could have learned this at an earlier point and that would have been great. So let's start with the most basic aspect of mass spectrometry. What are the three parts every mass spec is going to contain? We start with an ion source. Why are we talking about ions? Because if it isn't charged, you can't see it in a mass spec, nor can you manipulate it. So we're going to, uh, so the, the creation of ions from biological analytes is one of these, these prerequisites for doing anything in mass spectrometry. If you wanted to work in intact proteins, that's great, but in order to deal with them in a mass spec, you must, analyze, uh, you must ionize them. So we have to put a charge on these things. So the ion source is what does that. Most frequently, we work with something called MALDI, which involves zapping things with a laser and creating a plume of ions, or we make use of something called electrospray, where we, we have a, a liquid flow from chromatography and we apply a few thousand volts to it to get these peptides to take on charge. So MALDI or ESI uh, actually is one of the only Nobel Prizes that's been given in this space, so it's a big deal. All right, now mass analysis is probably the biggest black box in the field on this one. Uh, dealing with uh, the ability to separate out all of the ions that are present in the cloud of ions in the mass spec at any given moment in time is a process of mass analysis. So the instrument is going to separate all these different things that might possibly be in the instrument based on their mass to charge ratios, mass to charge ratio. Now if I say M over Z, that's because I'm being an American, it's M over Z I suppose. Um, so that is the mass in Daltons of this thing divided by the charge that it is carrying. In proteomics, it's almost always the case that we're talking about protonated ions, thus positively charged ions. So those get separated and sometimes isolated by or uh, modified by what charge state they're carrying and their mass. So mass to charge ratio determines everything about this stage. And finally, we've got the detector. Um, once you have uh, created a set of ions and you need to understand what they are, you're going to create a spectrum that reflects 
their mass to charge values on the x-axis and their intensity values on the y-axis. So um, sometimes telling it by a cartoon is a little simpler, so I'm going to try that. Frequently, the kinds of questions that bring someone to a proteomics facility are based around proteins, or maybe the modifications of those proteins. So they come to us with a protein mixture, and one of the very first things we do is get rid of the proteins by digesting them into peptides, typically with the enzyme trypsin. Does everyone know trypsin? Great, okay. So trypsin chops after basic residues, lysine and arginine, and that produces a collection of peptides, maybe 10 peptides per protein, so, in effect, we have made a complex mixture of proteins into an even more complex mixture of peptides. It's a little counterintuitive. So, this means that from this stage forward, our, our conclusions are going to be built around peptides, and any information about what proteins were there will be inferred from what peptides we've observed. So, we have a mixture of peptides. Frequently, at least in the rest of the world, if you have a very complex mixture, like a total cell lysate, you're going to rely on some kind of fractionation. Fractionation. There are lots of methods for this, um, but they range from things like separation by isoelectric point. Um, some, some people will separate their proteins in gels before they do digestion. Some people will do separation by a method called strong cation exchange. There's a long list of these, but these fractionation methods are designed to take this superset of all the peptides from a mixture and carve them up into, say, tenths or twelfths, or in extreme cases, 96. Maybe you have a 96-well plate that now reflects different 96 of the, of the total peptides of that mixture. You really can spend that much instrument time on one sample. Okay, so each of these peptide fractions can then be separated through liquid chromatography. In almost every case, you will find that the, the last column that leads into the mass spec is a, a reversed phase liquid chromatography column, which is to say that it has a bunch of hydrophobic beads in it. We sometimes call these C18. Uh, this is because they have 18 carbon chains pointing off of them. Now, naturally, if you have a bunch of long hydrocarbon chains uh, on these beads, the peptides that are most hydrophobic are going to stick to those really well. I sometimes call them greasy, but that's really a lazy shorthand. So we've got these greasy peptides all stuck to these beads. Some of them are really greasy, right? They're just covered with leucine, leucines and isoleucines and valines. These are really hydrophobic residues, and those things stick really hard to those beads. Others, on the other hand, have a lot of acidic and basic residues uh, or some prolines, and, and these things don't stick quite as strongly to these beads. This difference in their affinity for these beads is what's going to allow us to separate them as a function of time. So we're going to start by flowing a barely hydrophobic solvent over these beads, and those that are least firmly bound are going to flow off at that time. Over time, we're going to gradually increase this hydrophobicity, maybe a, an hour and a half experiment. 90 minutes is pretty common for one of these experiments. So you can imagine the hydrophobicity slowly rising through the space of maybe an hour, and as it rises, the peptides that are next uh, least well bound to these, uh, to these beads will flow off. So you might think, well, you're losing them, right? They're flowing off, uh, off these beads and leaving the column, but we're doing this in line with a mass spec. So as they leave the column, they get hit by this really high charge, the electrospray source, ions are made of them, and in they go to the mass spec. Now, the, the middle row of this, or sorry, the second row of this, all happens within the mass spec. So the ions have now entered the, the mass spec. Now, are they, are they proteins, peptides, or fragment ions at this point? Are they proteins? They're not proteins because we already digested that up, right? So the trypsinization of the first step produced peptides from the proteins. Have we blown apart the peptides yet? We have not. We've, we've charged them pretty heavily. I mean, the electrospray process is not nice, right? You're zapping them with a few thousand volts in hopes that some of them take on a couple protons or three protons, something like that. But these are still peptides as they flow into the mass spec. And it's a, a small subset of the, the peptides that happen to have similar hydrophobicity because they've all come off of the beads at the same time. So now we're going to measure the set of peptides entering the mass spec two different ways. One is that we're probably going to have an instrument that gives us a high-resolution picture of all of the peptide ions that are available at this particular moment in time. 
So typically, this first stage produces what we call a mass spectrum, which is to say a list of M over Zs and intensities, and all the different ions that we see represent the peptides currently available for analysis. So maybe you, maybe you have a fairly dense uh, sample, and you have a hundred different peptides that might possibly be analyzed at this moment in time. Some of them are really intense. They ionize really well, and they kind of dwarf out all the other signals. Others are more middling. You know, they're, they're, they're visible as discrete peaks, but they're not, um, they're not quite dominant like that. And there's any a number of peaks down in what we call the baseline, the grass, kind of the, the, low, the low stuff. So the instrument has to figure out how is it going to spend its time, because it has maybe a, a couple seconds with this current set of, uh, of peptides in the inventory. Typically, the way that these instruments are set up is to look for the most intense signals so long as they're in ones that haven't been analyzed in the last minute or so. So the instrument is keeping, keeping track of what's been processed in the last 30 seconds or last minute. And if, if a mass to charge appears on that list, it's going to act like it's not even there. But ions that are intense that haven't been analyzed yet will trigger a tandem mass spectrum. And that is the other kind of event. So we had a nice high-resolution mass, uh, mass spectrum that reflected the peptides currently available. And a tandem mass spectrum is going to be uh, conducted on a series of ions that appeared in that mass spectrum. This is a technique sometimes called shotgun mass spectrometry or data-dependent acquisition or information-dependent acquisition if you're working with a different vendor. It doesn't matter. But uh, so the ions that are intense, we're going to serially isolate and, and fragment them. So we have an ion that appears pretty big in this mass spectrum. The instrument says, OK, I'm not interested in anything it, that doesn't have a mass to charge of x, where x is where that peak appeared. So you have all these other peptide ions in there, and the mass spec says, boom, you're gone. And the only thing that remains is that one peak. So this means that we have maybe several thousand copies of some particular peptide ion. We might have some uh, co-mingling that we have multiple ions of the same M over Z. But generally, this sample is, is dominated by some number of, of, um, of, of, of copies of some particular peptide ion. We then use a process called collision-induced dissociation, or CID. This is a, a process that a lot of people say uh, just rips apart rips apart peptide bonds. That's a really, really bad explanation of what it does. But the short version is that we have this peptide that has some number of amino acids. And the process, in effect, will cause the, an individual peptide bond within these peptides to, to snap. Uh, and that gives us an ion that represents the, the left side, the N-terminal side of the peptide, and another ion that represents the C-terminal side of the peptide. That's our starting information. The list of fragments produced by an exploding peptide it's a really terrible definition, but we'll just go with it for the moment. The list of fragments produced by an exploding peptide are, are what we're starting from in a tandem mass spectrum. This results in a mass spectrum. This process results in a tandem mass spectrum. The, this mass spectrum is used to decide which peptides we're going to target. Each peptide serially gets targeted, blown apart, and we catalog its fragments in a tandem mass spectrum. So that's a really important concept for everyone to get. The tandem mass spectrum is kind of the death cry of a particular peptide getting blown apart. Please forgive me, everybody who knows about fragmentation chemistry. So disruption steps. There are lots of things we're doing to these proteins along the way. And I want to try to make sure everybody keeps it clearly in your mind which parts are happening in the mass spec and which ones are happening out. So we start with denaturation and reduction. I haven't really talked about those, but these are important sample ha handling steps. Proteins have these complex structures, right? And so long as these proteins are folded up in native state, they're not all that easy to get at for trypsin. And we want the peptides we produce from each protein to come from all over that protein sequence, not just the, the, the bits that are easy to digest on the outside. So one of the things we're going to do is cause these proteins to unfold, to denature them. Most frequent, frequently, the, the approach we use for this is something called urea. Urea is really good in solution for causing these proteins to stretch out. But there's a hitch, right? Because a lot of protein structures are held into place by these little safety pins. OK, they're not safety pins, but I think of them as safety pins. You have two cysteines from different parts of the protein that were close together, and they form a disulfide bond. 
Everyone remember your protein structures? Oh, that's good, okay. So these little safety pins are gonna be a problem. No matter how hard you hit them with urea, these disulfides are holding this fold roughly in place. So we're going to reduce them, typically with dithiothreatol, or DTT, and then we will do something more to make those cysteines uh, blocked. We'll, we'll block them with an alkylation step so that they don't reform those safety pins. Okay, so this process of denaturation and reduction is something that we do on the bench. And typically, we do that even before we get to the trypsin digestion step. All good? Okay, so we've dealt with structure. That's good. We, we have some process of enzymatic cleavage. Now, I mentioned trypsin is our favorite. Trypsin gets used all over the place, all the time. We generally use a special version of it that doesn't do a lot of autolysis. Um, so you can't just, you know, isolate it out of a, a cow stomach and off you go. It's generally a, a, a sequencing grade trypsin, for example. Um, but it's not the only option either. We, we can use methods that will cut at methionines, like cyanogen bromide, or you could use glue C that cuts to the C-terminal side of glutamine, uh, uh, glutamate, sorry. Um, we have a lot of options on this score, but typically trypsin is the, it kind of rules the roost. Most of the time, the fragmentation process, process that we use to cause the peptide ion to uh, create a cloud of, of fragment ions instead is collision-induced dissociation, or CID. It sometimes goes under different names, and there are some slight variations in how it is performed. One of the most popular ones that we hear in the Western Cape uh, is uh, HCD, or higher energy collision-induced dissociation, but it's really just CID with a little bit more energy behind it and the energy directed somewhat differently. This is, uh, so a lot of this stuff comes around CID. There are other methods altogether that can be used. Some people working in Fourier transform mass spec will hit their ions with a, a laser, an IR laser, which kind of heats them a little bit and causes them to dissociate. Some people use a method called ETD, or electron transfer dissociation, that causes it to break differently. In this case, we're really only going to care about CID because it is far, uh, far and away the most popular method for producing fragment ions from a given peptide. Am I going way too fast? Okay. All right, so a very key difference for everybody to know, a question that I seem to ask every year, I don't know quite why I do this one, but it's, it's one that I really, really like. We have mass spectra, we have tandem mass spectra. Understanding why these two is different really matters to me. A mass spectrum shows you what's available from electrospray at this particular moment in time. A tandem mass spectrum is the death cry of a peptide. I'm sorry, that's very romantic. Um, it is a, it's the set of fragments produced through the process, typically of collision-induced dissociation, from a peptide that's been isolated. In the case of shotgunning, at least, that's, that's what the definition would be. Typically, it means that some subset of ions have been selected from a mass spectrum. They've been manipulated independently of all the other stuff that appeared in that mass spectrum. That is tandem mass spectrometry. So up at the left, we see that the ions that appear in this mass spectrum represent different peptides that are available. We see there's a peptide at 735.37. There's one at 645.34, another at 455, blah, blah, blah. These are different peptides, different sequences. They, the only reason that they're showing up at the same time is that they have similar hydrophobicity. They're coming off the column at the same time. So the instrument now selects one of these, bombards it with gas, which causes it to heat, uh, to heat in, in vacuo. It deals with this by breaking into what we call B and Y ions. And this is the list of fragments produced from just one ion there. You see we've got this little green stripe here? That little green stripe is telling us that whatever it was that we blew apart to make this tandem mass spectrum, it had a mass to charge of 898.92 in this case. So that's different between these two. The tandem mass spectrum remembers what was blown up to create it. The mass spectrum is just everything. Okay. How do we interpret tandem mass spectra? All right, now I've, I've taken a whole semester long class in how to interpret tandem mass spectra. I will not get that time back. But you get these two or three minutes to, uh, to understand this concept. So I'm, I'm going to try to walk through it. Imagine that you have this peptide. How many amino acids in the peptide? Anyone counting? Ten. Very nice. We have ten amino acids. T-S-I-I-G is the first five. T-I-G-P-K. 
Everyone remember their amino acid codes? What, what's a T? I hear someone say three name. Yes. <laughs> ah, yes, it was Janine. Janine said three. Hit three. That's very, very nice. Great. All right. How about that P down there? What's that? Proline. Very nice. What, what's the final amino acid? Say it. Say it. I think it's lysine. It's lysine. Brilliant. Well done. All right. So why is it that tryptic peptides have a particular preference for that last amino acid? Where does trypsin cut? Basic amino acids, lysine being one. What was the other I mentioned? What's a, what's a pirate's favorite amino acid? Arginine. Arginine, very nice. Well done. You guys are on top of this. <laughs> yes, that will never leave your brain now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so arginine and lysine are special in the triptych world because peptides tend to end in K or R. Very good. Now, I have 10 amino acids. How many peptide bonds are present in this peptide? Of course, I have 10 amino acids in this peptide. How many peptide bonds do I have? Nice, yes, nine, very good. So computer scientists run into this problem all the time. It's called a fence post problem. They say to themselves that uh, how, how, many, uh, how, many, uh, how many fence posts do you need to build a 60 meter fence if you're putting a post every, every 10 uh, meters? And they say, okay, 60 divided by 10 is six, which is wrong, right? Because if you're building a linear fence, you need seven posts for a 60 meter fence if you're putting one every 10 meters. In the same way, we have 10 amino acids Peptide bonds only occur between amino acids, therefore you have nine peptide bonds. In this case, I've drawn a red stripe through one, two, three, four, the fourth peptide bond. So we are going to create an ion, a fragment ion, of the left side, the N-terminal side, that will be called a B ion, and we have another ion that's formed of the last six amino acids, and that's going to be a Y ion. Why are they called B and Y? I haven't told you that part. It's kind of a long story, but the short version is if it were to break, um, if it were to break one carbon earlier, that would be an, an, a, uh, an X, uh, sorry, a, a, an A, uh, <laughs> an AC pair. If it broke past the nitrogen, it would be a C, Z pair. But when we break at the peptide bond, we say that is a B, Y pair. It's a, a terminology from the 1970s. We stick with it. So we're, we're focused on producing B and Y ions from the breakage of these peptides. Now, we have a special name for this first one. It's not just any B ion. It is the B4 ion. That's because the B ion here contains one, two, three, four amino acids. So the, we created in this peptide bond breakage a B4 ion, which tells you that the other one must be a, an after ion. That's right. No, okay, not an after ion. <laughs> it's called a, a Y6 ion, and you know I totally created a Y a B4 uh, ion in the slide just to tell that joke. That's okay. So we have the last six amino acids leaving in a Y ion. They have some differences because there's an extra water uh, in these. So if you had a B ion and a Y ion that had exactly the same sequences, they would still have different masses, which is kind of odd. That's true. So you can imagine then that you can figure out what the mass of the B4, or what the mass to charge of the B4 ion would be, because we know what the mass of threonine is. Who's got that one ready for me? Okay. If you're a, if you're a mass spectrometrist, at some point you'll probably start memorizing the amino acids. Okay. So how about isoleucine? Isoleucine and leucine have the same mass, and they are the most popular amino acid. Our cells love them. Does anyone know what the mass of isoleucine or leucine would be? Okay, its mass is 113. That's a good one to know just because it's so bloody popular. The other one I would really love for everyone to know would be glycine, the very smallest of the amino acids, just a hydrogen side chain. That's 57. These are residue masses. All right, so we can add together 101, 87, 113, 113. Don't forget to add one proton's mass so that we add one to that. And then we know to look in the spectrum, here at 415.2, we have the total mass of those four amino acids plus the ionizing proton. 
On the other side, we've got these six amino acids. So we can add together 57, 101, 113, 57, 97, and 128. Then we add water and a proton, and that gets us to 572.36. Great, right? So now we see that one breakage event at this fourth, amino acid, uh, fourth peptide bond has resulted in two different fragments for us to see. Now I want you to imagine in your mind's eye what would happen if you moved the breakage one amino acid closer to the end terminus. First off, what would we name those ions? You saw the B and a Y, but what are they called now? B3, Y7. That's really good. Well done. Okay, so we've moved, uh, we've moved one amino acid, uh, one peptide bond further to the left. Now we have an ion that contains TSI, our B3, and one that starts with IGT for our Y7 ion. How much mass difference would we have between, let us say, the Y6 ion and the Y7? 113. 113, thank you, yes. The mass of isoleucine, or the, the, the mass to charge that's, uh, that's happening here is, is 113 different. So 572 is our Y6. Where would a mass, uh, an ion with a mass 113 higher be? 572 plus 113, who's got my answer? She's got it. Tell me. Speak your, speak your truth. <laughs> 572 plus 113 is? 685. When we look in the spectrum, what do we see? Check it. Right there it is. Okay, so hopefully, I know we've belabored this exercise. I don't expect you to reproduce this on a quiz or something. That'd be awful. But if you, if you, if, if you now have, have proven in your mind that the sequence of the peptide relates to the fragments we see in the tandem mass spectrum. Has everyone got that part? Some yes, some no. All right. So as these peptides break, the fragments that they produce, the, the dominant peaks that we see in the tandem mass spectrum, should be explainable given the peptide sequence. Now, I would ask you, how many of us, after this little three-minute exercise, would feel comfortable looking at a tandem mass spectrum and trying to infer the sequence? It's dodgy. It's hard to do. And you can spend can blow away a half hour on, on one spectrum just trying to figure out what you think the sequence should be. So the software that we use to identify peptides does not read the spectrum. It does not read the spectrum and say, ah, well, I, I deduce that the sequence that should match to this uh, spectrum is this. You can do that. There are tools out there that do that, but they do not dominate spectral identification. It's really, really hard to do, and the algorithms that we use for in inferring sequence are quite error-prone, quite error-prone. Instead, we use an approach that looks something like this. On the bench, you started with proteins, you digested them up to make peptides, you ran an, an LC-MS-MS experiment, you produced a pile of tandem mass spectra, millions in some cases, and now we must use software to get us to a list of peptides that uh, can be used to explain each spectrum. We will then figure out which ones of those identifications we actually trust, which gives us a list of peptides we we're confident in. And then we will infer proteins that explain the, the appearance of those peptides. It's, it's long and a little tumultuous. This stage in particular tends to be a very slow one. Uh, but now that we have clusters of computers to help us, uh, that tends to go relatively quickly. So this diagram is one everybody should be able to explain well, I think. Um, database search algorithms were first published in 1994. Um, I was still in high school at the time. <laughs> Maybe some of you weren't born yet. I don't, I'm not actually sure on that score. But uh, we have, uh, we've had a long time now to work out a lot of the problems uh, in this approach. And now database search has a very long established history as the way that we identify the peptides of these complex mixtures of proteins. So, how does it work? I want to point out that the ions that we see in the tandem mass spectrum are only used at this very last stage of scoring. We will use early on the observed mass to charge value of the en entire peptide, but we don't look at the fragments until the very last stage. 
So we're going to start by the fact that database search looks up the answer in the back of the book. The genome projects have provided us very good lists of all the proteins possible for each organism. So imagine that you've done a few bazillion RNA-seq experiments in humans. At that point, you should have a pretty good notion of which isoforms are possible and which isoforms are not, which uh, transcripts are possible, which transcripts are not. So having a transcript sequence, you can translate that to get putative protein sequences for that species. Okay, so these putative protein sequences are typically expressed in something called a FASTA database. We didn't talk about the FASTA, uh, the FAST alignment algorithm. It's, it's, a, it's a, an early, a, a predecessor of BLAST, a, a very fast way to search through large databases. So people don't generally use FASTA anymore, but the format that they introduced uh, is, is, a, is very much a standard. So we have a, a set of, of proteins that are possible for this organism, and we, we download that from some genome website, maybe from RefSeq, maybe from Uniprot, and that provides us all possible protein sequences that may be identified in this sample. From that, we have an in silico trypsin digester. Has anyone heard the term in silico before? All right, so you might have in vivo, meaning in the organism, in vitro, something you did on the, on the bench, but, uh, or in, under the glass. And in silico, we typically used to say, uh, is, a, is an activity that occurs inside the computer, right? So here we have an in silico trypsin digester. It is saying, in effect, if I were to digest all possible proteins for humans, say, what are all of the peptides that might result from that? Okay, so that gives us a very large number of peptide sequences. We then have to consider the possibility that some of them have been chemically modified in some way. One of the most common ways that we do this is uh, based on oxidation. If you have a, a sample that's been sitting around on the bench even a tiny period of time, it's likely that some of the methionines have changed in mass. Now, methionine starts at a mass of 131, if I'm, correct, if I'm correct, and then we add another 16 mass units to it to create 147. Am I, am I doing okay? I hope I've got my numbers right. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll feel embarrassed if I get that wrong. But we see that methionine has changed in mass to become more massive just because it oxidized on the bench. We have to take that into account, or we would fail to identify this modified peptide, because its peptide mass would change, right? And the, the places the ions would appear would also change in response to that. Okay, so we decorate these peptides to reflect the PTMs, the post-translational modifications that they may be carrying. The magic of Sequest and all of the software that derived from it, Sequest was the one that we published all the way back in 1994, um, is that Sequest doesn't compare every peptide to every tandem mass spectrum. That would be very wasteful, right? Instead, we compare only those peptide sequences to the spectrum that are very close matches to the mass, the parent ion mass that we observed, which is to say, what was the, uh, the, the mass that we inferred for the peptide that blew apart to create this tandem mass spectrum. So we're not just going to use the fragments for identifying it. We're going to use what was the mass of the thing that we blew apart to make this. It's kind of a magical piece. So this peptide mass filter may be very, very efficient. If you had a high-resolution mass spectrometer producing that mass spectrum, you probably know its mass to something like 0 0.02, or 0 0.002 um, mass to charge value. That's an incredibly tight tolerance. So you may, it, you, you might have thought, well, I've got to compare thousands of peptides to the spectrum to figure out what it is. But if you know the parent mass accurately enough, you, you don't have to check as many possibilities. Okay, so now we've decided that all of these peptides that are possible from this proteome have a very similar peptide mass. Now we need to figure out which of them is the best explanation for what the spectrum looks like. So we now need to predict what fragment ions should we see if this peptide blew apart. We, we did it just a moment ago. We were, we were looking at a, a fragment ion, and we said, what would the mass be if we added, a, added a, a leucine? Remember, we added 113, and boom, there it was. It's a very similar process. The software is going to say what fragments should be occurring if it were this peptide sequence, and then it simply looks at the spectrum to say, is that one there? Is that one there? Is that one there? Is that one there? And by one of the most common approaches, a, a match counter, 
the sequences that match more fragments have a, a better score than those that match very few fragments. It's relatively straightforward at the end. So the software isn't paying attention to what those fragments are until this very, very last stage. It decides which peptides can be compared to the spectrum based on the mass of the intact peptide. It decides which of those sequences wins by which one matches the fragments in the tandem mass spectrum. Both of those elements come into play. Okay. Generally speaking, um, today, high mass accuracy is a characteristic of lots and lots of mass, spectro mass spectrometers that we would use. For example, the Center for Proteomics and Geno Proteomic and Genomic Research here in town has a Q-Exactive. The Q-Exactive gets accurate mass measurements for both the peptide ions themselves and for the fragments that they produce, which means that we have a lot better bead on where to look for a given ion. We don't have to allow for as much mass error in doing this matching process. A lot of people make use of time-of-flight instruments. I've already mentioned, uh, for example, the triple TOF that my friends up at CSIR use in Pretoria. But there's also a triple TOF here in town. Uh, if you work with, say, the Jonathan Blackburn lab over at UCT, you can also work with a triple TOF there. We also have some older style instruments, like an old Agilent in town, uh, that are also this QTOF design. You can see that their mass accuracy is measured in PPM. PPM. Does everyone know what PPM is? Uh, no, it, it, we, that is, scan rate is not a bad guess here, but what? Parts per million, exactly, right. So if you, if you think you know the mass, uh, if, you're, if you're predicting the mass of a 1,000 M over Z ion, you can ask what would 10 parts per million be? That's 0 0.001 M over Z. It's a tiny little error. So when you, uh, you, you can easily discern at that level which, uh, which isotopes are present for a thing. It, telling one neutron's difference apart is trivial on instruments like this. Okay. In the old school days, like when I got my PhD, we only knew the, the mass accuracy within 1.25 of, of our peptide ions. That's because we were using very old school quadrupole ion traps. Happily, most of you will not have to deal with data sets of that, uh, of that type anymore. All right. Now, I, uh, I try to limit myself on how many equations I show you, but I'm going to show you just one. Uh, so here we have an example of one of the very first scoring approaches. Uh, we have an electrical engineer in the room, and uh, uh, electrical engineers tend to make use of this technique called cross-correlation a fair bit, or mechanical engineers do anyway. They're the same thing, right? No, they're not. <laughs> they're not the same thing. All right, so cross-correlation is can be shown in an equation like this, but I'm going to try to show you with my hands. I hope you don't mind. If, if somebody wants to talk their way through the equation, they can do that. You, you don't want that one. All right. So let us imagine that we have an observed tandem mass spectrum, right? This was collected on the instrument. So this is experimental data. We also have a theoretical spectrum. This spectrum does not exist. It's a virtual spectrum, if you will. But this spectrum was predicted on the basis of some peptide sequence. We said, okay, we think there should be a Y1 ion here, and a Y2 ion here, and a Y3 ion there, and so on. This is projected uh, based on some sequence in the database. I want you to imagine that if we lay this down against a spectrum that it really does match, we're going to have a really good correspondence between what we projected to see and what we did see. Now, here's, here's the squirrely part. We're going to add a tau function, an offset between the two. So, if I just look at this spectrum like this, I might say, oh, that looks pretty good, right? But we'd like to know how much of this is random matching. You don't want to put an advantage on sequences where you predicted lots of fragments as opposed to those where you predict very few fragments. So we're now going to rub one spectrum against the other at various little offset values. So you should have a pretty good offset at tau zero, but as you scoot away from that, you're going to get some amount of random matching. That's what this graph is. This graph, published when I was still working on my driver's license in the United States, has a, a point of tau zero, where we see a very high score reflecting this match at no offset, and some matching at values above, zero, uh, above tau zero or below tau zero. The sequest score compares how big it is here to the average size here. That's one way to do it. It's nice because it's kind of resistant to noise matches, and helps you to uh, get a sense of how the score stands out against uh, some sort of background matching behavior. That algorithm has been used 
since 1994. Now you see this other paper here in 2008? The guy who wrote the 1994 paper, Jimmy Eng, really fascinating guy, good friend of mine. I've hidden him <laughs> under, under, under different circumstances. There, there are plenty of interesting stories he could tell about me. I had a really disastrous personal life in grad school. But I would just say that he uh, realized after more than a decade had passed, 14 years, is that the difference? After 14 years, he realized that there was a simplification he could have used in his math that would allow this cross-correlation function scoring to take place more than an order of magnitude faster. Imagine how many grad students waited for weeks while their data sets processed away on their awful little Pentium 3 computers. Oh. Anyway, so he corrected his math, republished it in 2008. Now most implementations of the Sequest algorithm make use of this speed up. There are lots of other ways, and I want you to think about some statistical approaches to this as well. How am I doing on time? Terribly. Okay. So we see that uh, we have a hypergeometric distribution approach for this. Hypergeometric distributions are scary looking. I think most people remember that when you've got two numbers inside these parentheses, that means a combination. And you could probably look up how to do that, but it may not be clear. So let me instead talk about a jar of marbles. I actually have a jar of marbles at my office. I forgot to bring it for this lecture again. That's OK. We'll just go on with it. I have a jar of marbles representing this spectrum. The jar contains 1,000 marbles, 100 of which are black and 900 of which are white. Is it, have I remembered my numbers? I did. OK, so these 100 black marbles represent locations in the spectrum where I found a peak. The white marbles represent a place in the spectrum where I might have seen a peak, but I didn't. All right, so think of the spectrum now cut up into little one Dalton bins, and each one is either represented by a white marble or a black marble. If there's a peak, it's a black. If it's not, it's white. Now, I have sampled from this jar a set of marbles. This set of marbles were not drawn randomly. I drew them from the locations that should have a peak if the spectrum represented this peptide. So I can say, if I look in my hand, do I see more black marbles than I would expect to have occurred by random chance alone. Sneaky, huh? All right, so in this case, all these numbers say the original jar had 100 black marbles, 900 white marbles. The, in the entire jar was 1,000 marbles. In my hands, I have 15 black marbles and five white marbles. Already, you should be thinking, well, that's not likely. If you were just drawing marbles at random, how many should be black by random chance in 20 draws? Ooh, you didn't know there was a question coming, did you? Okay, let, let's start with a simple one. I have a jar that's got 100 black marbles, 900 white marbles. I draw a jar, a, a marble at random. What's the problem? What, what, what color is that most likely? Black. It's most likely white because we've got a nine to one ratio, right? No worries, no worries. Okay, so what is the probability now that that one marble is black if I'm drawing at random? One in 10. Or you could do an odds ratio on it. You could say that I've got a probability of one out of 10 versus nine out of 10. That's a nine fold yeah, well, odds ratio, whatever. You could do stuff like that. Okay, if I draw a bunch of marbles, uh, just draw, a, in this case, 20 marbles from that jar, I would expect about a 10th of them to be black marbles. So having drawn 20, I would expect two to be black marbles. Okay. But you can compute the probability of this particular outcome using this formula. And at the end, we see the probability of this particular outcome would be 3.63 times 10 to the minus 12th. So this is very much contrary to what you'd expect by random chance. The probability of drawing exactly two is pretty darn high by comparison. So we can use this probability now as a score to associate with this peptide spectrum match. PSM. That's something that shows up all over the place in our literature now. So we have a hypothesis now. It's not just an observed spectrum. Now it has a hypothesis that this particular spectrum represents this peptide, and it has a number on it. Okay. Great. So you see that I've defined it on the next slide. I, I, I kind of jumped ahead by one. Sorry about that. So... We have a whole pile of these. Remember that this one experiment may have produced a million tandem mass spectra if you have enough files that you've all jammed together 
naturally, uh, you have a, a, a weird sort of multiple testing problem. Each spectrum has now been compared to potentially thousands of different sequences, and each one of those got a score. We accepted the one that scored best for that spectrum. It was, high, it was the highest score or it was the lowest score, depending on how it works. We've now accepted that uh, for this spectrum, our best answer is this with that score associated with it. That's already one problem. We've said of all the peptides that we could use to explain this spectrum, which one does best? But there's still the, the quite, quite high likelihood that this spectrum has been falsely assigned to a peptide sequence. That's awkward, it's uncomfortable, but it's real. It is not appropriate for us to say every possible peptide for which we have any evidence in this collection looks like this. That's going to be, uh, it, that's, that kind of list is going to be so filled with errors uh, that it's going to be really hard to find any signal from all that noise. One of, the, one of the nasty things that really bothers people in our field is that if you're doing really, really well and you have beautiful data from a, a high-resolution instrument, you might identify as many as 50% of the spectra you collect. You might. More typically, the number is closer to, say, 15%. That is hard for people to deal with. Why is it that we're generating so much data and so little of it is, in, is interpretable? This is a, a big conundrum for our field. So we need to have some way to say, for which of our spectra do we find our hypothesis about a peptide spectrum match is reliable? Two major approaches have come out for this. One is distribution modeling. Uh, my good friend Alexei Nesvishki at the University of Michigan is a real genius in this space. Um, so he, uh, try, he tries to answer this question for each spectrum. What is the probability that this peptide spectrum match is real? Now, the, the broader approach, the one that gets very, very frequently used in our field, is much simpler than that. It's not trying to answer this question for each spectrum. That's actually quite hard to do. Instead, it says, for this collection of spectra, what fraction of them are bogus? And from the discussion of false discovery rate uh, yesterday, you probably are thinking to yourself, well, that sounds awfully familiar. Yes, so, con so controlling the error rate for a whole collection of peptide spectrum matches is a much more common uh, approach. So how does that work? I'm going to just try to, to do some, some very basic explanations on these. A, a simpler method like false discovery rates is a little easier to explain. The answer is that when we provide sequences to database search, we don't just provide real sequences. We also provide a whole bunch of bogus sequences. So that might seem like we've just made this problem even worse on ourselves, right? We have a whole bunch of real sequences and we have a whole bunch of bogus sequences. So what, can, what information can you possibly get from having a bogus sequence assigned to a tandem mass spectrum? The answer is, you know that those are bogus. So when, when a spectrum is assigned to a peptide that only occurs in a, in a false protein, you know that that one is false, and you can see what score it received. I want you to imagine that under my hand, I have my list of all spectra from the very highest scoring in the database search to the ones that got the very worst score. They're down on the floor. So I've, I've sorted this whole pile of PSMs now from best to worst. Where would you assume that the, that the falsely identified peptides are? Are they right up, up, up here touching my fingers? These are the best scores we got. Typically, the, the lower you go, the closer you get to the floor, the more enriched you are for bogus PSMs, for falsely identified spectra. These up here close to my fingers are generally the ones that are most concentrated in good IDs. So we now need some way to say, where can I set a bar against this list where I've controlled my overall error rate? So if I set the bar right where my right hand is, everything between, these, between my fingers would be called an accepted or a confident peptide spectrum match, and everything else is trash. Right? This is how it typically works. So we need to have some way of assessing what is our likely error rate for that whole collection between my fingers. And the answer that we most typically use is to say that the number of false hits between my fingers is equal to double the number that are known false PSMs. So we have a bunch of decoy hits, maybe from a, a sequence that's been reversed uh, from its biological order. 
And we can double that number to say, that's the number between my fingers that are bogus. That's one of the ways, then, that we can control the overall false discovery rate. This is very, very widely used. There are, there are papers about it. Some of them I like, some of them I don't. But uh, generally speaking, this is a, an accepted approach within my field. Now, a, a point that I feel not enough people understand is that we are not directly identifying proteins. We are identifying peptides by their death cries, right, by the tandem mass spectra that they've got. So the peptide doesn't remember anything about the protein it comes from. It was digested away from that, right? So the peptide has no memory. It's not as though all the peptides appearing in a mass spectrum all come from a single protein. They don't. The peptides are, are separating independently from each other in chromatography. So shotgun proteomics produces tandem mass spectra that represent the fragments of separated peptides, of isolated peptides. We infer a set of protein sequences that best explains the peptides that we've detected. We're, this is inferential. The MSMS has no memory of the protein that it comes from. There is a whole field of proteomics called top-down proteomics. Um, I, I think I may have mentioned uh, a, a, a researcher who has an interesting dance style and uh, is really amazing to hang around with at a conference, frankly. Yeah, he runs one of the best top-down labs in the world. Uh, and uh, you, you might want to read this paper if you're really interested in learning more about direct measurement of proteins. All right. So why is it that inferring a set of proteins for peptides is so difficult to do well? Why are peptides shared among different proteins? You should already have some hint of this because we've been talking about orthology and paralogy. Right? So orthologs are direct evolutionary counterparts derived from a common ancestor through vertical descent. Those are pretty words, aren't they? It's a little hard to get, though, so you put it in, in a nicer language. Whenever we speak of the same gene in different species, we actually mean orthologs. I, I want everybody to have that one deeply internalized, because when we talk about orthology, as we frequently do, because a lot of us are working in model organisms, knowing what an orthologue is really matters. In contrast, paralogs are genes within the same genome that have evolved by duplication. Over time, you may find that a, a particular gene shows up in many variants within our genomes. So both of these lead to individual peptides appearing in multiple proteins in these sequence databases we're working with. We may try to identify proteins against a multi-species database. In a case like that, you're going to have to deal with orthology, meaning that an identified peptide could be explained by proteins from multiple species. Even if you're just dealing with a human protein database, it's still quite likely that an individual peptide maps to multiple, pro uh, multiple gene duplicates, multiple paralogs. Now, did I include a slide about the other problem? Oh, I didn't. I would just point out that in many protein databases, we see that different transcripts are translated and listed separately in the database. So if you have multiple transcripts from one gene, even if there's no gene duplicate, you can still have that peptide appearing in multiple protein entries. So isoform differences or transcript differences can also lead to this multiple listing. OK. Let us talk about the problem of parsimony. Has anyone mentioned the term parsimony to you before? No. Oh, one has. That's good. OK, how about this? Who here has an older brother or sister? All right. I, Akita, can I pick on you for just a moment? Did your older brother or Is it an older brother or older sister? sister? Older sister. Did your older sister ever call you a name? Probably. I have an older brother. I have an older brother. He's still around. Hi, Tom. Um, my, my brother um, was a bit of a pest, I must say. A bit of a pest. And I have to say that one of his favorite nicknames for me was Cheap. We would be at, at the local Walmart, and we'd be looking at the toy section with kids, right? And I would see... Uh, oh, I remember there was a, 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 a Apollo... Uh, Apollo 11 rocket that you could break up into multiple stages and stuff. I thought that was the coolest thing. I really wanted to buy this rocket, but it was expensive, you know? And my, my allowance back then was a quarter a week, 
Yeah, well, these are the old times, right? Back in the 1980s, <laughs> you weren't around yet. So, uh, so yeah, I had, my, uh, I had my quarter a week, and I wanted to buy this rocket, but it was going to take me a while to save that up. And my brother would say, why don't you just do it? Just buy it, for crying out loud. And he would punch me in the shoulder and say, you're too cheap. Now, as a scientist, we sometimes get called parsimonious. But this is not a criticism. It is a praise. And, it, and, and ironically, parsimonious means roughly the same thing as cheap. Very weird, huh? So there was this fellow, William of Ockham, um, back in 14th century, who wrote, Pluralitas non est polenda sine necessitati. Great, right? One way to translate that is, plurality should never be posed without necessity. So if you have a complex hypothesis for something, or a simple hypothesis for something, generally speaking, you should go with the simpler model. If you, if you want to see this, uh, this hypothesis spelled out at some length, you might go see the movie Contact. It's um, available from Netflix, etc., I guess, but uh, old Judy Foster film. They, they talk quite a lot about Occam's razor. That's what it means, that you should take a simpler hypothesis to explain something rather than a more complex one. In the world of proteomics, this rule about being stingy with your hypotheses definitely applies when you're counting proteins. There is a lot of pressure in the proteomics community to make the biggest possible claim about your amazing technology. With my technology, I can see 20,000 proteins. With my technology, I can see 97% of all possible proteins from mycobacterium tuberculosis. It may sound like I'm, I'm talking nonsense up here, but if you read some of the papers from the big hat proteomics community, you're going to see a lot of claims that are deeply bogus. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use controlled language because this is on video. It really makes me mad. Very, very mad. So people have been making these extravagant claims about what they can do with their amazing mass spectrometer or their astonishing algorithms, such novelty, such brilliance. Only we can do something this amazing. And then you have somebody who shows up at a facility like CAF or a facility like CPGR and they say, I want to do what was published in this paper. How do you tell someone that, that person is lying through his hat? That's awful. So in the field of proteomics, it's far better to make a very controlled, a very careful estimate of what you've accomplished with your data. And being parsimonious about protein claims is one of the first things that we can do. I want to talk a little bit about the xenografts. We've, we've talked about those in a previous day. Here we have a human tumor that is being grown in a mouse. Here we've dissected out of a, a poor mouse uh, this, this human tumor, and we're looking at the proteins that we've identified from that. I want you to know that each peptide has some number of hypotheses about which protein gave rise to it. In the case of this next to last uh, yellow peptide, it could have been produced by table 1Y human in any of these isoforms. It could have been from table 1X mouse. It could have been from table 1X isoform A in human. Or it could come from table 1X isoform B in human. All of those are possible uh, hy uh, hypotheses. And in the late 1990s, lots of people would have said, we've seen all of these proteins based on this set of peptides. They were talking through their hats. Parsimony means that we need, to, we need to account for the set of peptides we've observed with the most minimal set of proteins that can explain them. In this case, you could claim all seven if it were the late 1990s, but under publication rules today, you would need to have a parsimonious list instead. And the two proteins that we've put in a double box here, those by themselves are capable of what in graph theory we would call a set cover. Those two proteins explain all of the peptides we've observed. That is a difficult thing to untangle because we have these very complex relationships between proteins and the peptides that could be generated from them. So when someone gives you a proteomics paper and they say, we found 2,560 proteins, it is worth your asking, how parsimonious is that list? because lots of people are very non-cautious about this. <clears throat> I'm not going to do this slide. Okay. 
So this brings us to the intermission, but I also note that I have already been talking for an hour and 15 minutes, which means I've given myself only 15 minutes to talk about quantitation. Frankly, that would be irresponsible.